I wanted to move forward as a maker. So I, you know, after seeing and living with and collecting these beautiful pots, I made some drastic decisions, <laughs> big changes. I decided that I fell in love with pinch pots. What is up, Shaping Nation? This is Nick Torres here. And on today's episode, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Kate Morantz. Kate makes some really incredible hand-built pottery that she used to make wheel thrown pottery, but made the switch to coil building and pinch potting. In this episode, you'll learn why Kate made that switch. You'll also learn about how Kate networks and uses networking abilities to help her do workshops and produce her own workshops. Finally, you'll learn about why you need to be making bad pots in order to find your own unique voice. And there's so much more in this episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. Welcome to Shaping Pottery and share with me, what is something you believe potters should be doing to have success in pottery? Well, I definitely think that if someone is interested in having a unique body of work, it's important to really be experimental with what you're doing and make a concerted effort to do something semi-original. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to make functional pots, there are, of course, limitations to what can really be functional or really even utilitarian if that's something you're interested in. But it's important to educate yourself and absolutely agree. I love that advice. So tell me a story how you got started in making pottery. Well, I went to UW Stout for my undergrad education and I began as an art education major, but then during my drawing one course I decided to add the studio art BFA. And I really didn't have much experience with clay other than, you know, elementary school, a little bit of middle school, some high school. So I took my required class in undergrad thinking that I was going to be a painter. <laughs> but once I got into ceramics, I just completely fell in love and, you know, something really clicked for me and that, you know, it was just kind of history. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been working with it ever since. I love that. So what made you continue going down the pottery path? Like pursuing ceramics or like as a profession? Just pursuing ceramics, just like just the journey itself. Like what made you continue it? Sure. I honestly, it was the first time we were on the potter's wheel in my ceramics one class in undergrad. We had the first quarter of the class was hand building and I really enjoyed that. And I was in the studio all the time working with it, but our first day on the potter's wheel, that just felt like magic. It just really clicked for me, and I just lived and breathed being in the studio and being on the potter's wheel, making functional pots. Absolutely love that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your pottery in just a bit, but for now, tell me about the story when you became an emerging artist for Ceramics Monthly. Sure. I... You know, it's it's an open application process. And honestly, I had no expectation that I was going to be selected as an emerging artist. When I applied, that was the first time that I applied. I just kind of decided that I was going to apply sort of as practice. And, you know, I told myself, I'm not going to get it this year, but maybe I'll get it next year. And to my surprise, <laughs> they selected me as one of the emerging artists for Ceramics Monthly. And I was just totally shocked and completely over the moon. Yeah. What were you feeling when you found out you became an emerging artist? Well, at the time I was a teacher and we actually had an in-service day. So I was in this, you know, it was kind of like post COVID zoom meetings for these in-service days. Like we were all kind of split up around the school attending meetings via zoom. And I got an alert saw it pop up during my zoom meeting and fortunately i didn't have my camera on and i was happened to be standing at a standing desk <laughs> for my meeting and i just started jumping up and down and <laughs> like fist pumping and <laughs> it was just a, an incredible moment for me i love that so you mentioned that you were a teacher can you tell me more about that yeah well like i said i double majored in undergrad and in undergrad, I repeatedly considered strictly pursuing ceramics, but I'd had this dream since I was 10 that I was going to be a teacher and, you know, it felt like a stable career and 
was something that I was really interested in. And I've always really cared about education and access to education and having good teachers. So I decided, all right, I'm going to pursue that. And, you know, for now, I'm going to be just a part time studio potter around my teaching schedule. And, you know, I, I really loved teaching and I still love teaching, but I just have come to the point, you know, in, in the last few years where being a studio potter really clearly became a major priority for me. When was the moment when you realized that being a studio potter is more the priority for yourself? Well, there wasn't really one moment, but I think like a lot of people during quarantine, you know, you had time that we didn't have before to really do some self-reflection. And that was a really challenging time to be a teacher. And especially actually the, you know, time after quarantine was really rough being a full-time in-person teacher and then also teaching remote at the same time. I just felt totally zapped of energy and, you know, was really kind of losing my excitement for, you know, teaching day in and day out. <laughs> and it was really hard to kind of accept that. But in 2020, I think I started seriously entertaining the idea of being a studio potter. I think that was the first time that I really, truly considered that as a legitimate option for me. I love that. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. But for now, let's talk about your pottery. Can you tell me the story how you started making the pottery that you make today? Yeah. I was a wheel thrower all through undergrad. You know, that's what I really fell in love with. I mean, I loved clay right away, but the potter's wheel is what really hooked me. Like, that's what really convinced me that ceramics was my thing, that that's where I needed to be. But after graduating, I really kind of lost interest in the processes that I was using and the work in general that I was making. So, you know, at that time I was starting my career as a teacher and I just really didn't have the time or energy to put into continuing to make. So my first few years of teaching, I didn't make anything other than demo pots <laughs> for my high school students, you know, which in some ways was, was kind of nice to be able to take a step back after having a senior show and, you know, being stressed beyond stressed about that. But you know, within those few years of taking a break from making and focusing on teaching, it did give me the opportunity to live with pots and collect pots and really take time to reflect on what I was interested in within my collection and how I wanted to move forward as a maker. So I, you know, after seeing and living with and collecting these beautiful pots, I made some drastic decisions, <laughs> big changes. I decided that I fell in love with pinch pots thanks to Candace Smith specifically. I saw her pots at the Western Wisconsin Pottery Tour during one of their last years as a tour. And it was just so incredible. And I'd seen her, I ran across her on Instagram originally, but seeing her work in person just really was amazing. And I decided, all right, I'm going to switch techniques. I'm going to teach myself how to make pinch pots because that's not something I'd ever actually really done, probably since kindergarten. <laughs> so, so I got in the studio and started playing with that new technique. I went and bought stoneware, which I hadn't used for years. I'd been working with porcelain bought some books to read on hand building. Um, Sunshine Cobb and Melissa Weiss have fantastic books that really helped guide me in those early months of making and just decided to get to work. I made a lot of different kind of styles of work, all pinched and all in this dark stoneware. But I decided to just start experimenting and I wasn't really focused for a while on making a body of work until I was satisfied with where my technical skill was going and until I kind of decided what I wanted my work to be about. I love that. Shapey Nation, you don't have to be stuck doing the same thing over and over again. If you want to make the switch from wheel throwing to hand building, you can definitely do that. I love that. 
So now you are inspired by your natural surroundings. How does this impact the way you make your own pottery? Yeah. So when I first started searching for kind of my voice within my work, I really took some time to reflect on what I was interested in outside of ceramics. I found that that's been a good guide for me in creating a cohesive body of work is just finding, you know, that kind of that theme that I wanted to pursue. So I was really interested in like sculpture in general. I love Barbara Hepworth's work and she's always been a great source of inspiration for me. So I started looking at cocoons and bones. I took a, several life drawing classes in college. I was really interested in, you know, those forms. And I decided to, you know, take qualities of those things that I was interested in and try to find a way to bring that into a functional body of work. And that started as a very literal interpretation of turning a seed pod into a cup. But I decided to continue working and kind of abstracting that idea because I wasn't necessarily interested in being super literal. You know, I did want more of an abstract interpretation of of those elements that I was interested in. So why seed pods? What seed pods? What 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 drew you to that? I just think they're really beautiful objects. You know, that's something that you see regularly or at least I see regularly in rural Wisconsin and you know I, I peeled them apart as kids like all different types of seed pods and it just seems like something that I could work with like a, an object that I could translate into ceramics you know pots or vessels seed pods or vessels. <laughs> so that just really made sense to me. I love that. Shape Nation, if you have an interest in something else other than pottery, you can apply that interest into your own pottery. I love that. So now can you walk me through how you coil build your mugs and how you get the shapes, get it to shape, like how you shape it? Sure. All of my, my pots are made in sections. So anytime that you see a ridge in any of my works, that shows you where a new piece of clay is attached and then pinched up from. So, you know, I make a variety of mugs, but like those four layer mugs where the handle kind of like squishes and compresses the form a little bit. I work, you know, on that first section. Um, I work just on a banding wheel, just using that coil and pinch approach. I do sometimes use, I have an extruder to extrude coils just to make the process a bit faster and, you know, even just a little more gentle on like my fingers and hands for the long term. But I allow things to dry. I've got a little plastic greenhouse that I use as, um, you know, as kind of a damp box. So I put pieces in there, allow them to dry to leather hard, attach the next section, pinch that up, you know, I cut the rim down to whatever angle and height I want, put it back in the damp box. So I often revisit pieces through a few days or several days in order to finish them up. So most layers are completed within just one day. So you can kind of count the days <laughs> that I have revisited the pieces. I love that. That was an excellent explanation of that. So let's talk about the business side of pottery. Can you tell me about the moment when you decided to go full time with your pottery? Well, going back to, you know, quarantine, right? <laughs> that was kind of when I started entertaining that idea. And honestly, once I received that, like, Emerging Artist Ceramics Monthly publication, I I got a, a great boost in confidence. You know, I felt like, for me, the work that I was making was really outside of what I'd been pursuing up to that point. So it was just incredibly validating. And, you know, sometimes when you're working uh, in your own studio, I don't work in a community studio at all. I'm in my own space and it's rural. There aren't, you know, a lot of makers around here and there isn't a very strong arts community in, in my specific area. So, you know, you kind of live in a bubble a little bit and, 
you know, I was kind of worried about how people would really receive my work. Like I was excited about what I was doing, but that was no guarantee that other people would care (laughs) or be interested in what I was making. And applying for that and the long shot of being awarded that and then getting that award was, I think was a, a moment where I thought I could really do this. I could actually make this happen. And, you know, I didn't leave teaching for a couple of years after that, but that gave me the encouragement that I think I needed to really continue pushing to apply for shows and sales. And, you know, I knew that I could make that happen once I'd kind of laid the groundwork for that professional transition. Absolutely love that. That is super cool. So what were you feeling when you decided to go full time? Mostly excitement at that time, but also a little bit of terror. (laughs) And, you know, the terror increased as my teaching time, you know, the ending of that slowly approached. And I feel like the excitement kind of stayed the same. (laughs) You know, I felt like it was something that I knew I could do. I'm a bit stubborn as a person. I'm definitely an anxious person, but I'm stubborn. So I will panic a lot about things that I'm concerned about, but I will also kind of dig my heels in and I'm a little like I'm kind of convinced that I can kind of do whatever I set my mind to. I just have to work hard enough and take advantage of opportunities. So yeah, it's been a lot of work, (laughs) but it's been really exciting. I love that. Shape Nation, sometimes you just have to dig your heels in, be a little stubborn and just hope and continue working hard so you can make your dreams come true. I love that. So outside of selling your pottery, you also do workshops. Can you tell me more about this? Yeah, that's something that I've really just kind of started to, I think, break into. You know, networking, anyone who's really interested in getting into teaching workshops, it really is about networking. I mean, so much is about networking. I think many of the opportunities that I've been offered or been able to take advantage of have come from you know, taking the time to reach out and get to know people and make connections and just being sincere and authentic. So I was, I met somebody at Ensika who actually lived just a couple hours from me. It was funny. We were joking because we're both from, or not from, but we both live in Wisconsin and we had to go to Cincinnati, Ohio to meet. (laughs) So we ran into each other in Cincinnati at the Expo Center. And he, after seeing my work, was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm familiar with this and my students would love for you to come and do a workshop. So he just kind of threw that out there at me and I snagged that opportunity and, you know, kind of used that to present myself as, you know, as an educator. You know, I have a background in teaching, but, you know, that isn't the same as running a workshop, but that experience helped me reach out to other places and connect with other places. And now another place has reached out to me without me reaching out to them. So now I have a workshop at the end of February in Waukesha, Wisconsin. That's an in-person one for a full day. And I have a virtual workshop with Pocosin. They reached out to me, which was really exciting to not always be that person reaching out and searching. But, you know, once you've established yourself, the opportunities will start to come to you. I love that. So now what advice would you give to someone that is looking to network with other potters themselves? Yeah, I found that I think the best moves I've made kind of professionally in general would be that I have volunteered for, you know, assisting with pottery tours. I, you know, spent a few days on a few different pottery tours, helping out potters at different stops, helping them, you know, with checkout, with bagging things that sold, you know, like helping out with making snacks <laughs> for different stops, like just helping people and getting to know them and sharing your enthusiasm for making with other makers while, you know, working hard and making good work. You know, you have to make good work in order to make opportunities happen. That's your first step. Uh, But once you've made good work, 
making those connections with others, you know, that's what's going to lead to really incredible opportunities. I love that. Shaping Nation, the most important thing is to make good work. The better your work is, the better it is, and easier it's going to be to network with other potters. I love that. So let's talk about discovering your voice. Can you tell me about the moment when you knew you were heading in the right direction with your pottery? Yeah, there was there was one mug that I made. It definitely has some similar qualities to my like finalized or like current body of work, but of course have has some differences. And, you know, I I keep it in my studio space and it is an ugly, ugly thing. <laughs> that I made and I knew that it was ugly when I made it but there were moments in that piece that I was just really excited about and that one ugly mug that I made you know led me I think to the body of work that I'm making now so experimenting and you know like not being afraid to make bad stuff I think that especially for people who felt like they built skills and, you know, built up a body of work that was well received. It can be really discouraging to change directions and to have to like be bad at what you're doing for a while. Like you kind of feel like, you know, you're wasting like the skills and the support that you had previously. But if your heart isn't in what you're doing, then that tells you that it's time to make a change and it's okay to struggle again and to be, you know, con like concerned a little bit with where your work is going. Like that discomfort is, I think, a good thing in the long run. And you just have to like keep fighting through it. And it's just going to take time and energy and frustration, <laughs> but it's worth it at the end when you can come to something that you're really excited about again. Absolutely agree. I love that. And now, how did embracing making bad work how did that contribute with your growth as an artist well it gave me the opportunity to to make forms and even objects that i hadn't ever really imagined myself making before so you know being willing to have months pass where you're just making a ton of different stuff that is all unresolved <laughs> they are dissatisfied with like that's okay and is actually probably good right so being willing to do that is i think really significant to reach the other side and make something that is you know original and has a unique voice to it i don't i don't think a person can really reach that without struggling through that really awkward Phase. absolute agree shapey nation you're gonna have an awkward phase where your pottery is probably gonna look like crap but that is okay if you get through that phase that's where your pottery is truly going to start coming alive i love that what new opportunities started coming your way once you found your unique voice well that was when you know the first things i think that that kind of happened for me was i started to have galleries reach out to me about gallery representation about sending work to be kind of you know in their store space year round that was a really big you know big kind of moment for me the first time I got an email or an Instagram message like that and you know then after that I was invited to be in some exhibitions which was also a great feeling sending work to a new gallery that honestly I'd never sent work to before but whoever was the juror was excited about what I was doing and they wanted me to be a part of it. So, you know, making those connections and, you know, sharing my work that way was was really great. And and now I've been able to continue networking through those pottery tours. And I've been invited to be a part of several really amazing pottery tours in this year. And I'm really, really like beyond thrilled to get to do that. And, you know, it's all because I've built these connections and worked really hard in continuing to foster those relationships and continuing to develop my work, you know, not settling for, you know, what necessarily has been successful in the past, like continuing to develop what I'm making, even though it's been successful, like 
continuing to push my work and make changes that's been significant. What advice would you give to someone looking to discover their own unique voice with their pottery? For someone looking to really revamp their work, I think the first place to start is you know, take a moment to reflect on what it is you're really interested in within other people's work. Like, what are you really responding to? And I think also reflecting on your interests outside of ceramics can really introduce new and interesting qualities or forms or just ideas in general into your work. So, you know, get out there, look at other people's things you know, write down those things that you're interested in. Another great piece of advice that I received in undergrad was was from Susie Lindsay. We had her come do a workshop on campus and she had us write a list of qualities. So a list of like adjectives that we wanted to describe our work. So whether that was, you know, full or organic or sharp, edgy, you know, whatever kinds of qualities we were interested in, taking some time to really reflect on those things and then make work and ask yourself, am I achieving those things? Do I still want to achieve those things? You know, there are a lot of ways to approach kickstarting or restarting your work. That was some excellent pieces of advice. Kate, it has been so great chatting with you today. And as we're coming to a close here, what is one thing you want to hammer home with my audience today? Make ugly pots. <laughs> you know, like when you are feeling discouraged, experiment. It's uncomfortable, but, you know, and it's, it's, I feel like it's ironic me saying this because in undergrad, like, that wasn't really me. Like, I didn't want to try new things, really. I kind of had my potter's wheel and this vision, and I didn't want to stray from it. And then the end of undergrad came, and I just felt totally and completely lost. And the only option to really move forward, in my mind, was to just make a bunch of changes. And I think that that's all worked out for the best for me. I'm happy with how my journey has been but it was tough being in that position. So maybe, yes, be afraid to make changes, but do it anyway. I love that. Some excellent parting words advice. Kate, it was so great chatting today. Where can my artists go and learn more about you? I'm fairly active on Instagram. Try to be active on Instagram. So you can find me at kate.marats or you can visit my website, maratsceramics.com.